Okay, so again, verse 21 of chapter 10 of Genesis. Um, well, all we really need to do is back up to verse 20 just to kind of get the context there because we're going to go through the genealogies of Shem and everything like that. Um, but before we do, let me pray. Father, we thank you again for uh, another Wednesday afternoon that we can get into your word, Lord, that you can come and bless us uh, understanding the scriptures. And Lord, we just, we thank you as you've been with us these several uh, four, five, six months, Lord, as, as we've walked through some, some uh, meatier parts of the Bible, Lord, that just take some time to think about and pray about and to, to even talk about, Lord. So again, we ask that you would give us wisdom today and guide us in our reading and our, our conversations. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, so if you would, um, as you know this, uh, chapter 10 really is this uh, genealogy, this, this collection of the descendants of Noah, okay? And it gives all of this history of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And uh, several weeks ago, I gave that handout out of the, of the map of, of where Japheth and his descendants landing mostly in Europe, Shem staying in that Middle East, uh, what would later become Israel, and then Ham, North Africa, and parts of Arabia. Okay, so we went through a lot of the details on that type of stuff. And that brings us really to here in verse 20, and we're going to read 20 through 32, those last 12 or so verses of uh, this chapter. And um, then we'll kind of walk through this, get a little bit of uh, detail on who these folks are. Okay, so chapter 20, or I'm sorry, uh, chapter 10, verse 20. These are the sons of Ham, according to their families, according to their languages, by their lands, by their nations. And so that kind of closes that section. And then in verse 21, it says, also to Shem, the father of all children of Eber, the older brother of Japheth, children were born. The sons of Shem were Elam and Ashur, uh, Afrakshad, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram were Uz and Hul, Gether and Mash. Aprakshad became the father of Shelah, and Shelah the father of Eber. Two sons were born to Eber. The name of one of them was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. Circle that in your book, okay? Because again, whenever the scriptures give a name and then they give the meaning of the name, a, a, that is a significant person, that is a significant time that we need to understand, okay? So again, verse 25, two sons were born to Eber. The name uh, of the one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan became the father of Omadad and Shelaf and Hazmavath and Jera, Hadoram, Uzal, and Dikla, and Obal, and Abamiel, and Sheba, Verse 29, and Ophir, and Havilah, and Jobab, all these were the sons of Joktan. Now their settlement extended from Mesha as you go toward Safar, the hill country of the east. These are the sons of Shem, according to their families, according to their languages, by their lands, according to their nations. And these are the families of the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies, by their nations, and out of these, the nations were separated on the earth after the flood. Okay, so remember, chapter 10 is like a bird's eye view. It is an all-encompassing, a lot of detail uh, chapter of coming off the ark. Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the sons and their wives, and a big overview of all these descendants, all these that would later become people groups and nations, okay? Okay. Chapter 11 is going to give details of what is talked about in chapter 10. Okay? If you remember, remember when we studied Genesis chapter 1? And then Genesis chapter 2 was the detailed version of what had already happened and been explained in chapter 1. So again, this is Moses writing chapter 10 in a good Hebrew fashion, making sure you get the big picture first. And then in chapter 11... He gives you a whole bunch of more details. Okay? So, verse 21. Shem, the father of all children of Eber, and the older brother of Japheth, children were born. 
Remember, Shem is where we get the Semitic people. The Semitic people, okay? Of those Semitic peoples, the descendants of Shem, we know when we get to Genesis chapter 12 and God calls Abram, the Israelites, the nation of Israel, that lineage of Abraham, are from the descendants of Shem. Okay? So again, if you are against Jewish people or, 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 or uh, uh, bigoted towards Jewish people, you're called an anti-Semite. That's where they get that. Semitic and Shem. Okay? So um, here we have, uh, in verse 22, the sons of Shem were Elam and Ashur, Arpachshad and Lud and Aram. Okay, let's just get some details in here. Elam, they become the Elamites, E-L-A-M-I-T-E-S. And they become a part of the Medo Persian Empire, the Medo, M E D O, Persian Empire, which again becomes important. You study the book of Ezekiel, you study the book of Daniel. The Babylonians come in and conquer and enslave the Israelites. The Medo Persians are that big conquering people that overthrow the Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? Ashur. This descendant in verse 22, Ashur, he uh, gives rise to the Assyrians. The Assyrians. Who again take over part of Israel. They invade later on, these Assyrians. Okay. This descendant Lud in verse 22. They become the Lydians, L-Y-D-I-A-N-S, the Lydians, L-Y-D-I-A-N-S, the Lydians. Sometimes it's called the Ludians, but depending on the spelling, okay? And then this Aram, he's very important, actually. This Aram, all right? becomes the Arameans, A-R-A-M-A-E-A-N-S. Now, Aram, what's another word that you know from the Bible that sounds like Aram, or the root is Aram? Aramaic. Aramaic, okay, was a language very much like English is today, okay? Everybody all over the place, whether you're a Japheth's area or the Shem's area or Ham's area, Aramaic was like that business language, okay? It's an offshoot of Hebrew, right? And remember Hebrew uh, and Jewish people, the, the rabbis, they would argue this. Hebrew is, goes back to what Adam and Eve spoke, how they spoke to God in Hebrew, And then this Aram, he gives rise to this people groups, the Arameans, and their language becomes very important. So important, in fact, that several thousand years later, Jesus, when he's walking around in the streets of of Israel, he speaks Aramaic. Okay? So again, important, important there. Verse 23, the sons of Aram were Uz, or Uz, Hul, Gether and Mash. Now, Uz is important to know in verse 23 because who is from Uz? Job. Exactly. Yep. This also helps us place the time frame of the book of Job. Okay? Now, I know Genesis is obviously in, in both the Hebrew Bible and our Christian English Bible. Genesis is the first book. But actually, the book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. Okay? Job is the oldest book. And here we have it established of the sons of Aram, or Uz, Hul, Gether, and Mash. 
which is why, again, most Bible scholars place Job, okay, the time of Job was more than likely right after the flood, within a couple of generations of the flood, and the Hebrews treat Job as if he was a patriarch. He lived in the time of the patriarchs, probably before Abraham. Okay, He lived before Abraham, but obviously lived after Noah. So he lived in that, that chunk of time frame there. Okay? Not much is known about this Hul, Gether, and Mash. I, didn't, I couldn't find anything really in my research at all. Okay? Um, Arpachshad became the father of Shelah. Shelah became the father of Eber. Okay? These, um, again, not much is here that you can find uh, in the history books, but it does lead, again, to verse 25. Two sons were born to this Eber that's mentioned in verse 24. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. This is pretty interesting, okay? So again, Peleg, and in the Hebrew, it's, it's literally Peleg. It is P-L-G, and then you throw whatever vowel you want in there, okay? It means division, divided up, okay? And chapter 10 is the big overview, right? Chapter 11 is the details of everything that happened in chapter 10. So where it says that uh, two sons were born of Eber, the name was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. The earth, the nations, and the languages. The time that Babel happened, happened during when Peleg was around. Okay, Nimrod gets all of the attention during the Tower of Babel, but Peleg, okay, the son of Eber, that was his lifetime that, that this happened. Okay? So, for in his days the earth was divided, the people groups, they're all scattered about. God confuses the languages, okay? And again, as you go through chapter 10 and chapter 11, when he, when he um, scatters the peoples and the languages, it's scattered into 70 distinct nations. 70. A nice, good Bible number, right? Okay? And Peleg is when that happened. With again, obviously Nimrod. Okay. All right. Um, Joktan became the father of Omadad and Shelef and Hazar Mavath and Jera. Again, in all my research, I couldn't find anything on these folks. Okay. Hadoram and Uzal and Dikla. Um, again, not much. I couldn't find any much uh, there. Ophir, Havla, Jobab. These were the sons of Joktan. Okay? At least with these, Ophir, Ophir, Havla, and Jobab, these are all families of Arabia. What would now be Saudi Arabia. Um, in verse 29, Ophir, Havla, and Jobab. They're all in Saudi Arabia or Arabia. Okay? Now their settlement extended from Mesha as you go towards Sephar, the hill country of the east. And that's that Arabian Peninsula. That's, that's what that is. Okay? So then Moses, in a good Hebrew fashion, he closes up chapter 10. In verse 31, he says, These are the sons of Shem, according to their families, according to their languages, by their lands, according to their nations. Okay, so again, he's describing everything that happened with these families in chapter 10 that would include coming off the ark, spreading around, having families, multiplying, lots of descendants, people are moving all over the place. Okay. But ultimately, it also is describing the scattering of Babel that we get the details in in the coming verses in chapter 11. Does that make sense? Okay? All right. So these are the families of uh, the sons of Noah, verse 32. 
according to their genealogies by their nations, and out of these the nations were separated on the earth after the flood. Okay. Questions on chapter 10. A lot of names in there, a lot of people groups. <laughs> Hard to pronounce. Uh, but again, it's good. Take a little bit of time. It is still God's word. We need to know it. Okay. Yes. Sure. Right, right. Because, uh, again, um, did Adam and Eve have other sons and daughters other than uh, Cain and Abel and Seth? Yes, and, and they do, okay? So what Moses, again, is doing here is it, it's a little bit more of a formal Hebrew thing to do. The the the. I hate to say it. I mean, they're all important, but the most important leaders of these families, those are the ones recorded in chapter 10. Yeah. Okay? Yep. All right, so chapter 11. Okay, chapter 11. Our last chapter that we will cover in this study. Okay? Let's go ahead and read the first nine verses. Okay, we're going to tackle this. Uh, this these nine verses is one passage here. Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. All right, I'm going to pause. Uh, again, we're Gentiles, 2021. We like things in chronological order because that's how we think. But remember, chapter 11, this is the Hebrew scholar, Moses, right? Led by the Holy Spirit. And so verse 1 takes you back to those few first days of them coming off the ark. Okay, so he's going back to that. All right. Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. It came about as they journeyed east. Okay, as in they journeyed east of Ararat, the mountains of Ararat. That they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone, and they used tar for mortar. They said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city, and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. The Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. Okay. So, we got Noah and his family. They've come off the ark. Some time has passed. They're basically still in that area of the mountains of Ararat. We've had a, maybe a couple generations go by. Uh, they're having children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And there, right there in verse 1 of chapter 11, it says, The whole earth used the same language and the same words. Okay. Um, it, it literally means they were of one lip, one set of words, is what it means in Hebrew. They were of one lip, one set of words. Okay? They didn't even have different dialects. They didn't have regional accents. They didn't, nothing. They all used the same vocabulary. Same words meant the same thing, no matter who you talk to, okay? When they were there, the same language and the same words, okay? And again, um, the, your, your rabbis argue that this is Hebrew, okay? Verse 2, it came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. The they being these couple generations after the flood, Descendants of Noah. 
that they journeyed east and they found a plain in the land of Shinar, okay, or Sinar, S-I-N-A-R, okay. Right, if you were to, if you were to try to find this place, you're, you're talking about um, the region of northern Iraq, parts of Syria, parts of uh, Afghanistan, all in those areas would be considered the ancient land of Shinar. Okay? Later on, as we get into the nation of Israel, we would call this the land of Babylon. And again, they borrow from that Babel. Okay? It becomes Babylon. And this area of Babel, or Babylon, or Shinar, gives rise, gives birth to pagan worship. This is where it starts. Okay? So it came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. Now remember, when the original uh, Noah's family, when they got the ark, they were, they were given a blessing, be fruitful and multiply and do what? Fill the earth. As in, God is giving you a command you were to have families, large families, lots of descendants, children and grandchildren, and you should keep moving out, keep spreading out. I've given you domain over the whole world. I've created this earth for you. Yes, you are fallen. Yes, you are sinful. Okay? But I have not, uh, I have not forsaken you. You are still getting this blessing of spreading out over the earth. I've created it for man. They don't do that. What they do is they find a good place to, to hang out there, this plain in Shinar. All right? And we know this. Before the flood, you had the four great rivers of the, of the Garden of Eden. Okay? Afterwards, there are two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, that seem to be in the general same area of where the Garden of Eden was. So there are some Bible scholars that, that basically say, hey, God may have kicked us out of Eden, we're going to make our own Eden now. Okay? So from the very core of this, all right, to the best of their knowledge, they're going back to where the original Garden of Eden region was. Remember, it's a big region. Okay? And if God has kicked us out, then we're going to be the ones in charge. We're going to lead the way against this God that kicked us out of Eden. That is what's going on here. That's the backdrop to what is chapter 11. Okay? So they said to one another. It actually means they had a council. They came together as a council. And their official eldership or government or whatever they had, they had a council together in verse 3. Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for for mortar. Again, don't think that these are just primitive cave dwelling type people. Okay? These are folks that are living hundreds of years still. All right? There is shared knowledge from the pre flood world because you have Noah and his wife and the sons and the wives. They highly developed worldwide society before the flood. They bring a lot of knowledge with them, they're passing along. All right, and so they're making a city, if you will, um, in verse 4. They said, come, let us build for ourselves a city. Do they have any godly mandate to build a city? No. There, there is no divine direction or command for them to build a city. A city is where a whole bunch of people come together. That's in direct um, antithesis of what they were supposed to be doing, which is having huge families and spreading out more and more and more and having domain over the earth. They said, nope, we're going to concentrate everybody in one spot, one spot this Shinar, and we're going to be the ones in charge. Okay? Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. They used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. Now, the Hebrew there is a little confusing when it's brought into English. It, what they are literally saying is a tower of heaven. A tower of heaven. 
They're building a pyramid or a ziggurat, uh, a, 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 a tower, okay, a building structure that is of heaven. They are saying, hey, the Lord has kicked us out of Eden. He brought the flood. Okay? We're no longer worshiping this God. All right? We are going to have heaven here on earth. That is what's being built here in verse 4. They're building a city around it. And this is a ziggurat, a pyramid, a tower of heaven. Not reaching heaven. So oftentimes we think, oh, they're building a really tall skyscraper. Okay? No. No. It's a tower of heaven. All right? Whose top... See where it says will reach? I think in your copy, is it, is it italicized? Okay? So, so again, it's in brackets. That means most manuscripts, those words are not there. And the words are not there... Because this is a really hard part of bringing it from Hebrew of Moses' day into English. It is a tower whose top of heaven. We don't talk like that. Okay? So the translator said, let's put in will reach. Because that's how we speak in English. But those words are not there. Okay? So it is a tower of heaven. Or a pyramid of heaven. So you should be thinking temple. Huge, like Egyptian pyramid type structure or a Sumerian pyramid. And again, a lot of scholars, a lot of biblical scholars argue this was the prototype. This was the prototype pagan structure that after Babel happens and he confuses the languages and they go off their separate ways. This is why you have so many ancient pagan religions and they're always centered around a... A pyramid, a ziggurat, some sort of temple worship thing. Okay? Whether you go out east into the Asian countries, you find ancient mounds and ancient temples and, and ancient uh, ziggurats, stepped pyramids. Okay? You find them in Central and South America. You find them in Africa. You find, you find them everywhere. Okay? And it's because, again, biblical scholars would argue, they're bringing this prototype pagan worship from Babel with them. Does that make sense? Okay? Oh yeah. Central and South America. Yes, there are. Absolutely. And again, almost always, no, not almost, always, those ziggurats and those pyramids, okay, have to do with that culture's pagan religion and either animal sacrifices or in the more gruesome instances, Human sacrifices. Okay? So they said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top of heaven, and let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad the face of the whole earth. Okay, when they say make for ourselves a name, okay, Sem, S E M. All right. This is very close in Hebrew to Yahweh. In the original language, this is extremely close to Yahweh. Okay? So you could read it like this, and it would be a good translation. They said, come let us build a city for us, uh, uh, ourselves a city and a tower whose top of heaven and let us make ourselves the one or the I am or the being. That's what they're trying to get across there. We are going to be the ones in charge. We are going to be the rulers of this earth from Shinar and it's not going to be the God of Adam and Eve and of Noah and his sons. Okay? 
Let us make for ourselves a name, otherwise we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. They know they are wanting to fight against God's command. Okay, So, obviously we know this in the backdrop. As good Bible students, we know whenever you have a movement of people, all right, and it's against God, ultimately who is really orchestrating all of this? Satan is. He is. Okay? He's behind this. All right? Verse 5. The Lord, now we have the Hebrew word Yahweh. I do not think that is accidental. I think Moses is bringing the reader back to the fact of, hey, these people in Babel, they think they're Yahweh? No. This, verse 5, this is Yahweh. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. The Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language, and this is what they began to do, and now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Okay, the Lord came down to see. This is called anthropomorphism. Okay, anthropomorphism. It's a, it's a, it's a way of writing something to describe God acting a way that we understand. Do we know, does God know all things? Yes. He sees all things. He's present everywhere. Okay? But this, here in verse 5, when it says the Lord came down to see the city, again, I would argue, Old Testament and New Testament, whenever there is direct physical interaction between the one true God and creation, the earth. Who tends to have that role? The Son of God. Okay? Alright? So, this would be a theophany. A theophany. A T-H-E-O-P-H-A-N-Y. A theophany. A physical appearance of the biblical God. I would argue... It's going to be a pre-incarnate form of the Son of God. Okay? So the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. Okay, uh, again, that word tower, we didn't do this earlier, but we need to. Migdal, M-I-G-D-A-L, do not think of a long, skinny, tall tower. That's not this word. Pyramid, stepped pyramid, a ziggurat, a huge mountain-like temple. That's what this word is. Okay? It's for, it's for pagan worship. It's for pagan lifestyle. They're centering it here in Shinar. The Lord said, Yahweh said in verse 6, Behold, they are one people. And they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Okay. Now, this is not Moses saying that these men had the power of God, that they were omnipotent. That's not what Moses is getting across. What Moses is trying to get us to understand, they are building this pagan worship temple, ziggurat, pyramid. And the Lord is saying here, if I do not scatter them because of the fallenness of man, because of the sinful nature of man, this is going to consume them. And it's going to, they're going to spread it all over the earth. Okay? And because they all are one people, they all have the same language. Okay? This paganness, this uh, uh, rebellion is going to dominate their life. So I know this is a strange way of looking at this, but again, Moses is trying to get you to understand. What happened at the Tower of Babel was actually an act of God's judgment, and at the same time, an act of His grace. Okay, Judgment in the fact that they were supposed to be spreading out, they were supposed to be taking dominion over the whole earth, but they chose to have a pagan worship main tower pyramid area, okay? 
by spreading them out, okay, at least parts of the earth were not going to be totally and utterly dominated by paganism. Does that make sense? Okay? Because right here in the next chapter, chapter 12, in this basic area where Abram is from, Ur of the Chaldeans, that's the same area as Babel. That's the same area as Shinar. In fact, Abraham and his forefathers are pagan worshipers. You learn that in Joshua chapter 1. Abraham came out of Ur. He, he, he was an idol worshiper. And so were all his family. Okay? And so this is what's happened. It's an act of judgment that God scatters them. But it is also an act of grace that God scatters them because he's going to raise up Abram and this nation that follows him and they are going to worship the one true God in this area. Does that make sense? Okay? All right. The Lord said, Behold, they are one people and they all have the same language and this is what they began to do and now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us... and. Rabbis do not like that at all. Okay, Come, let us go down uh, and there confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. All right. So the very fact that you have a plural form here, you have to do something with this. All the texts have us. Okay? We believers, right, understanding of the New Testament, salvation in Jesus, this is not that big of a deal, right? We understand what this means. It means the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are involved, one triune God, one God, three persons, three persons, one God. So, Moses is led by the Holy Spirit to write the word, us. It's plural. It's plural in the original language. Okay, it's Yahab, Y-A-H-A-B. It's what it is. The ancient rabbis, uh, and even today, they argue, no, 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 you dumb Christians. That just means it's Yahweh and the angels. Okay, so they just, they, they have to figure out who else would make a crowd. Let's throw the angels in there. They have, there is no scriptural support whatsoever. But that's pretty much the only interpretation that they can come up with to make sure that it's not this trinity that the Christians believe in. Okay? So come, let us go down there and confuse their language. Okay? That, again, that word confused is balal. B-A-L-A-L. Confuse to mingle, to bewilder, to perplex. Um, it, it would, it would, it's like mixing two different liquids, okay, is what it would be used for. Okay, the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, they have one the same language, this is what they began to do. Now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. Okay? He causes confusion. He separates them. And it says in verse 8, So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Now, this scattered them abroad. There is argument amongst Bible scholars of, does that mean... He, he confused the languages and made multiple languages and those that spoke the same language would naturally congregate together and then go move off together. That's one thinking. Okay, I could see how that could be true. That makes sense. There's also a sense of, is this direct divine um, action? As in, he took this group of people and then miraculously moved them from point A to point B. I think either one could have been accomplished by the Lord. Okay? So I tend to lean towards the divine interaction of he, if you will, took this group of people 
They all had the same language, and he physically moved them to this part of the earth, and this part of the earth, and this part of the earth, which is how, again, archaeological records would show you man, after, after you get through the flood and all of that at evidence, man is all over the earth real fast, really fast. Okay? And so God is, again, I lean in this and the fact that God is divinely taking them out of the land of Shinar, throws a group of people into this newly formed, remember after the flood, continent of South America, North America, okay? The Australia, those islands, Africa, all throughout Asia and Russia. I lean towards the fact, because the way it reads, so the Lord scattered them. Okay? That word scattered, okay, is uh, pace, P E S E, if you will, okay? It's a verb. All right? And it, it truly means to be dispersed, to be scattered. Um, uh, it was used as. Uh, if in the Bible in, in 2 Samuel of a gathering army and then lightning comes down and strikes the middle of the army and they explode outward. Okay, that's the same word used. Again, to me, that makes me lean towards this is God scooping them up and moving them someplace else. Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So again... It, Either one, either way you look at this, okay, God is the one doing this, okay? Whether it's they just naturally in a human form gather together because, oh, that guy knows my language and that guy knows my language, right? And we all kind of gather together and then the hundred of us say, well, I guess we better stick together because we can't understand anybody else. And then travel on. I could see that. I could see human beings doing that. But I, I don't read it that way in verse 8, Okay? So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the what? Whole earth. Okay? They get spread out very quickly over the whole earth. Again, to me, that's kind of showing this is God doing this. Okay? And then it says, and they stopped building the city. That he changed their what? Yes, I would agree. That's what I'm saying. I, I, I think God was so specific in the fact that he chose to do 70 different people groups. He made these 70 different languages. I think he is directly involved, and he took this group and put them here, and this group and put them here. I think that's what happened. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> It's been interesting, yeah. Yeah, Carol? Uh, I think according to verse 8, that if it was scattered so much that they couldn't understand each other, that they would have been scattered and they would have been Yeah. To me, the, just the way the original language is written there, um, the fact that, again, verse 8, Moses uses the personal name of God, Yahweh. And usually that means he is now... He's personally doing an action, right? When, when, when he first introduces the name Yahweh to Moses, he's causing that bush to burn. Remember that? The, he's physically, divinely getting an interaction there. So that's why I lean towards this understanding, okay? I mean, people are going to argue about it all day long. But either way, we know this. They're scattered, and it's over the whole earth. There's no more Babel or that ziggurat being uh, built at least in Shinar. Another reason I think that this is God directly being involved, again, archaeological evidence, all within about a, a similar time frame, you have pyramids popping up all over the earth, all over the place. And to me, that is, that is pagan, sinful man leaving Shinar rather quickly 
and being thrown over into Central South America or North America, Australia, Africa, and all this other stuff. And then they start building up these nations, pagan nations, all over again. Okay? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay, so verse 9. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. So now it's said a second time that God did the scattering, and it was over the whole earth. Again, you know this, you study the Bible, if it's mentioned twice, you're supposed to pay attention to it. You need to understand it because a big event just happened, or a big truth was just revealed. All right? So, questions on one through nine. Are we okay? I'm sorry? Yeah, the fact that Moses writes the whole earth or all the people were there at Shinar, um, they're, they're all working in unison, disobeying um, the Lord's command to spread out. I, I, I believe so. I believe, I believe that they are, um, they are following Nimrod. They are, I would say, in a satanic rebellion against the Lord. I think that is what Moses is recording in these nine verses. I really do. Hmm? Satan leading this, inspiring this whole movement. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh huh. Who? Satan himself? Yeah. I'll say this. We know this. He, before his fall, he was an anointed cherub. He had a very special place of reflecting the glory of God throughout all of the heavens as he hovered above the throne. Okay? So, if you will, when it came to angels and, and rank and power, he was numero uno. Okay? So he is, and he is a spiritual based being or creature. Okay? When he fell, all right, he is a fallen angel. His fate is doomed. He is never going to be redeemed. Okay? And when you study the book of Daniel, it talks about an archangel wanting to deliver a message from God to Daniel, but he was delayed 21 days and needed help from other archangels as they fought against this Lucifer, this Satan. Okay? So I think he has kept um, his power and his rank and his, uh, if you will, um, I wouldn't say, I would say authority. He, he truly outranks the other angels. But he is going to be dealt with. He is going to be dealt with. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. Um, we got several verses left to go. Um, and my voice is starting to crack, actually. So let's pause there. And we're going to pick it up in verse 10. What I believe will be the final um, week for this study next week, if that's okay. Because... <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I've been fighting a little bit of a head cold in my... Throat is sore. So, questions on what we covered so far? Oh, um, I'll talk with Jonathan. Maybe, maybe he has to repost it or something. Oh, I'll talk with him. Some every once in a while, we'll put a video on there, and then it kind of gets lost out there. So, I'll, 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 I'll have him redo that. So. All right, let me, let me pray, and then uh, we'll gather together, Lord willing, next Wednesday, 
And we'll close out this study. Father, we thank you for, uh, again, being here with us. We thank you, Lord, that um, uh, truly you, you're never caught off guard. Uh, you know exactly what is going to happen past, present, and future. Uh, Lord, you are um, truly uh, awesome and wonderful and to be praised and honored and worshiped every day of our life. And Lord, we, we thank you that, again, we have this detail given to us by your servant Moses as, as understanding um, why the world today is the way it is um, and seeing all of these different origins and, and um, um, some very interesting things that we read here in Genesis 11. So Lord, be with us as we come to close in this, in this class, Lord, that uh, again, we would understand that every word of this is your word and it is important and it is uh, a blessing to us to read it to understand it and lord if it is your will that we could even teach it to another to another believer so lord we thank you we love you please guide us this week in jesus name amen thank you now